So what you're suggesting, what you've called it, is a conformal cyclic cosmology. Yeah. You think our universe has an infinite number, presumably, of cycles yeah, where you go well. from Big Bang to <laughs> stuff like us to the future and then repeats. Yes, well, the idea is that our Big Bang was the conformal infinity of a previous eon. I call it right. an eon. I like not to call our universe because we're all entangled with each other and it's a part of one big thing. So our eon, A-E-O-N, I like to think of it as, began with the Big Bang and ends, in a sense, with this squashed-off infinity. But if you apply the stretching at the beginning and the squashing in the future, you get a thing which looks a bit like a cylinder, and you can imagine that joining on to another tube, which was the previous eon. So its remote, fu remote future conformally, smoothly fits onto our Big Bang. And one of the exciting aspects is it might be observationally testable. Absolutely. Well, there are some new features on this. At first, I, I used to give lectures about this and said, this is, this is fun, and I can go on talking about this, and nobody will ever prove me wrong <laughs> because we don't have any way of seeing whether it's right or not. But then I started having an idea. Maybe one could see a test. And so the first thing I thought of was, what about black hole collisions? You see, our galaxy has a supermassive black hole in its center, so it's four, th four million times the mass of the sun. I think the Andromeda galaxy is one about 20 times bigger or something like that. Mm -hmm. And we are on a collision course with it. Not very near in the future, but you have to... <laughs> <laughs> We're thinking big here. It's yes, professional that's Professional right. cosmology. <laughs> <laughs> but eventually, these black holes will... The galaxies collide and the black holes will feel each other out. It'll take a while. Finally spiral into each other and there will be one whacking explosion which will carry away a significant proportion of the rest mass of the combined black holes. And that it will be gravitational radiation primarily, like the LIGO detection of the um, black holes and, that we've seen and very proud of. And now it's, this is a far, far bigger explosion. Right. Um, we might be lucky to see such a thing in a very distant future. Uh, distant, well, distant future, I don't know. Uh, anyway, uh, this explosion would carry out to the crossover between one eon and the next, and it's, you have to look at the equations now. You see, you need equations to, to, to do the gluing job from one to the next, and, and okay, you can produce equations which have nice behavior. And they indeed kill off the gravitational degrees of freedom, but they don't kill it off. I and mean, the degrees of freedom survive, but not as gravitational waves. They come through as disturbances in the newly created dark matter. So you have to have, to make the equations work, you have to have, we talked about dark energy, but this is dark matter. And that seems to be some real substance out there. But in this theory, it's got to be there. It's got to be uh, where the degrees of freedom of the gravitational waves get picked up and translated into this form on the other side. And these would produce signals that could be seen. They would look like circular features, maybe concentric ones, because in a cluster of galaxy, you know, there'd be a lot of battles between black holes swallowing each other up and then end up with one big whacking one in the middle of the cluster. And that's the one that, that finally you get. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. But there are claims... Uh, and arguments about whether we see these rings. I think the most persuasive argument was from my Polish colleagues. Um, they had a, 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 a first looking at the WMAP satellite, and then the later satellite was this Planck satellite, which did some very, very precise measurements of cosmic micro microwave background radiation, and they claimed to see signals of this nature with a confidence level, this is looking at the Planck data, with a comp confidence level of 99.4%. Nevertheless, people don't pay any attention. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, have they argued against it, or are they just uh, they, passing by know. in silence? It's very strange, because they... I mean, they had a lot of trouble with referees who said, look, you've got to do this, and then we don't, we don't believe you, you've got to do this test, that test. They did them all. The, the polls were absolutely... This is Christoph Meisner and... Pavel Mirovsky, and the, well, it's Daniel Ann, who's, who's a Korean, who did the analysis in that case. And they, um, 
in the Planck data one, they, they came to this conclusion, 99.4% confidence. Using all the tests, but the editor said, more or less, well, I'm afraid we're going to have to accept your paper, you <laughs> see, <laughs> despite all the complaints people had. Right. Uh, but you should say in the initial part of the paper, this might be a chance effect. It's always possible, yeah. It could be a chance effect. But, this is, but the good news is, you know, it's in the data. The data hopefully yeah. will improve. You've made yes. a prediction. Uh, people yes. will figure out one way or the but other. But what's more exciting is, is what's happened more recently. Okay. You see, this is the same, more or less the same team, uh, uh, the Polish team with Daniel Ann, and they were doing a, a slightly more sophisticated analysis, which came from a discussion I'd had with Christoph Meisler. You know, maybe you could refine the signals and see what the shapes of them are and so on. And they then found a particularly strong signal for some very small ring-like structures. And this was puzzling to me at first because it should be, uh, I mean, they saw some evidence for the bigger ones, but it didn't seem nearly so impressive as the small ones. But then it occurred to me that I had thought about this before, but I'd not really dared think about it seriously, which is the question of what happens to these supermassive black holes. See, any cluster will end up with a big, whopping great black hole in its center. Mm -hmm. This will gradually, gradually de decay over something like a 10 to the 100 years, Google years. I mean, sorry, in fact, uh, any cluster turns into a whopping big black pretty hole. Pretty well, right? yes. Yeah. I think pretty well all the matter gets swallowed. I don't know exactly what proportion it is, but you would expect, I would guess, yeah. pretty well, m most, most pretty well all the matter gets swallowed up. So you've got this black hole sitting there, and it sits there and eventually decays away by Hawking evaporation. Now, you see, Hawking evaporation is a very cold, most of it, and, it, you know, could pretty well ignore it. <laughs> Enormously long wavelength and yeah. ignore it. But as a total, it carries away the entire mass of that supermassive black hole. And where does that mass go? Well, you think, go think about the Escher picture again. You see, you have an event which is taking place right up near the edge of that boundary. And that means all the radiation which comes out is concentrated right at one little point. So you would have, according to this skit theory, what I refer to as a Hawking point. You see, it's a Hawking evaporation. And these Hawking points would be a release of an enormous amount of energy right at that point. And then it would spread out through about 380,000 years, which is the time between the Big Bang and the last scattering surface where you see the microwave background. And the amount it spreads out is to, well, uh, four degrees, which is about eight times the diameter of the moon. So mm -hmm. it looks you know, quite a sizable thing, but pretty small on the basis of you know, looking at the whole sky. So you'd Imagine spots of that size. Now, we wouldn't see them quite that size because our past light cone only cuts through a bit of it, so that's a little okay. technical point. But they're comparable, that size. Well, maybe, say, five times the diameter of the moon or something like that. But this is just the scale in which the latest analysis you seem to see in effect. And this would be regions where... I mean, they look at rings, uh, and you imagine this ring surrounding the Hawking point and in the middle it's hot and then it cools down as you get towards the edge of the ring as the, as the energy gets dispersed through this uh, this period of time from the big bang to the uh, um, 380,000 years and that spread you can see it's concentrating in the middle and spreads out and it's completely consistent with that and now the latest thing which is just about i think now on on the archive the latest version of this article um, is uh, we, we give a, a, a confidence level from the looking at simulations and things of 99.98% confidence. Now, this is just clearly out there in the data. Anybody something else can look. Yeah. They right. can, and if they see something else, we'll, we will have to see why. Why we will see a different thing. But the evidence seems to be out there, and it has this confidence level. Is Complete, clearly calculated of 99.98%. Now, one of the real problems for inflation of this, you see, is that the point you would be seeing, not the Big Bang in inflation, would be what's called the, the graceful exit moment. So inflation 
in the inflationary model, okay, started very close to the Big Bang, and then this huge expansion took place. And most things which happen in that region of this huge inflationary expansion would be spread out to an enormous size. So only at the very end would you get something which is restricted to this four degrees across the sky. And we don't see the signal bigger than that. That's right. the size of it. So if people come around and say, yes, they see the same signal we do, and they sh I don't see why they can't do that, um, then they would uh, say, well, how is this an inflationary effect? If it's due to inflation, it would be how something which just happened at the last minute. Just, just as inflation turned off at this point, where they have a lot of trouble with anyway, called it graceful exit. That was one of the reasons I had trouble believing in it, how you turn the blasted thing off uniformly over the whole universe, which seems a great problem. And more of a problem now, because it's not just uniform, you've got odd little points where there's a huge amount of energy spewing out. And I'm waiting to see what the inflationary explanation will be for these things. But the good news is, there, you know, we're talking about data now. We're talking about observations. Other people yes. can repeat the analysis and, and yep. we'll see what comes out of that.